uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is a parallel section for data simulation, ensembles, and uh, predictability. For today's meeting, and uh, it's 10 past uh, 12 here in Mountain Time and two, uh, 10 past 2 p.m. Uh, in East Coast. And uh, uh, we have, uh, this is a parallel section. So this is 10 minutes uh, talk. I will give a uh, um, eight minutes uh, mark, and uh, please uh, turn off uh, your uh, video and mute yourself uh, if you are not a speaker. And uh, if you have any questions, please go to a show it Slack channel to ask questions. Our uh, uh, will. Uh, We'll announce that after each talk about the uh, questions. Uh, okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, our first uh, speaker is uh, Mel Jack uh, Rensik from IMSG EMC, and he will talk about uh, generalization of uh, multi uh, grid beta filter scheme for modeling background error coherence. Please go ahead, uh, Mel Drick, and uh, you can uh, present from your own screen. And after you present, please just stop the presenting. OK, I'll try first. Let me see how to download this stuff. Uh, enter screen, or what do I press here? Present now a window. Present right? now, actually, yeah. Present now and show slides and present now to pick that screen. You you present screen. I'm, oh goodness. Present now. Yeah. window because I have opened this okay uh, please Can you see that no you can't I'm pretty much sure that I didn't do that right okay once again yeah please try again and we own you to this high tech <laughs> and I do have your slides here if you have a trouble I can show I, I will try to show and you can present oh okay great yeah let's do that i mean that is going to save some time mm -hmm. so yeah please go ahead if you can press my slides i'll just okay let me try that if i can do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah I okay know. okay okay did you see my so, slides yes i can see i don't know for others but can you put it in the present mode so that uh, big screen? Uh, yeah, okay, good. That's fine. So uh, uh, this presentation is actually uh, uh, we, we we were developing uh, within RTMA project a uh, new version of uh, uh, method for uh, develop for background error covariance. And uh, I put a lot of things here. I know that I won't have some t enough time, so please, you can go later on and look through my slides or send me email or to Jim Purcell, who is basically uh, uh, the main developer here. So let's go further. Uh, basically, I mentioned uh, this is done within uh, uh, RTMA project, and uh, the goal of RTMA and project and uh, there is now 3d version is to develop uh, uh, analysis on very high horizontal resolutions going to 2.5 kilometers in very frequent time intervals so this whole business is uh, very much time consuming and uh, uh, having uh, efficient uh, way to calculate background air covariance uh, is uh, like a key component of uh, for success of that business let's go further Thank you. Uh, I put some animations. You can press it several times. So, so far, uh, just a little bit history, we were uh, using uh, for uh, modeling of background error covariance uh, uh, recursive filters. Uh, and the recursive filters are very good uh, approximation for Gaussian. 
but they have a serious uh, uh, problematic issues. And the most important one is that these are essentially sequential operators, which are very difficult to uh, successfully parallelize. So our so solution to this problem within this UFS effort is the development of a new filter based on beta distribution incorporated within a parallel multigrid structure. So let's go further. If you can press a couple of times, uh, there are some animations that go once again and once again and once again. And that's it, last one. Oh, OK. I I'll tell you all about that, what are advantages. So here we have a short descri uh, dis uh, description of the beta filter. On the uh, picture on the right, you see that uh, this looks like uh, Gaussian. But unlike Gaussian, it has compact support, which makes uh, a strength of this uh, uh, method in computational sense. Let's go further, please. Uh, so uh, we use this uh, uh, beta filter uh, in a hierarchy of different scales, and that is combined into a uh, into through through a parallel multigrid scheme. And uh, uh, on the, uh, this small slide on the left, uh, I am uh, describing some of the basic uh, uh, steps in, uh, in uh, calculation. So uh, in generally, analysis and filter grid are not on the same resolution. So first step is actually to remap between analysis grid and filter grid. And then on the filter grid, that is basically first generation of the filter grid, we then uh, propagate uh, a solution through the scales, and we use term upsending. So basically, we upsend a solution through the scales, and then uh, we apply multigrid. Uh, we apply beta filter in parallel on all scales, and that is done to capture to better capture uh, the, the spatial variability, essentially. Let, let's go further. Uh, I'll try to explain a little bit more. So uh, on uh, uh, we have several squares here, and this uh, named G1 represent actually first generation. So what we are doing in this upsending sta stage, we actually half the resolution and consequently half the number of processors on the next generation, and we go up generations. Uh, and so this G1 actually. Uh, uh, is uh, one processor, but it covers the same area as the original uh, G1 and has uh, four times less resolution. So that's what we are going, doing in this multi-grid scheme. We go up and down uh, through, through scales, essentially. Let's go further, please. Uh, but uh, there is a critical step here, and the critical step is that in each inner iteration, we first need to transfer uh, or to remap from uh, the analysis grid to first generation of filter grid and go back. And you see, uh, these two grids are not on the same uh, decompositions. So uh, that was essentially one of the issues that we were facing, because in this decompositioning, every inner iteration, uh, though the scheme itself was very efficient, we were wasting time. Secondly, we didn't know how to efficiently generalize this whole process until now. So let's go further. I'll try to uh, fly to these slides. If you can press. Oh, yes. OK. Press a couple of times, please, because I had some uh, explanations here to do. So uh, this is explaining how uh, we were mapping filter, how we were collocating filter grid uh, processors on to the same place that occupy analysis grid processors. Uh, and let's go further. And that was not, uh, as I said, uh, 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 really working very well because uh, this re-decompositioning was a bottleneck. And so let's go further. I try, I'm afraid I'm not going to have enough time. So we came for the, with a, another scheme. And this another scheme is actually uh, removing re-decompositioning between analysis and filter grid. And so what we are doing here, now we have on generation one, it's the same decomposition as it was on analysis grid. 
So we just need to do a joint interpolations within processors. Now we group for four processors. And if we don't have space, if we don't have processors uh, which with, with which to group, we just use empty space. But we take care of very physical boundary. So this is how we go now from generation one to generation two, three, and four. So this is a generalized version to do that. And the advantages of this, there is no more need for re-decompositioning. Uh, filter grid is run on more processors. And the code is automatically adjustable to any, I mean, any, uh, it's, uh, you know, we have to be careful, but to many decompositions. What is a uh, problem or problem or uh, uh, issue? Uh, higher generations are now executed in parallel among themselves, but sequentially with generation one. So let's go further, please. Uh, I'm trying to explain how we did collocation uh, so that we maxim maximize use of uh, processors. Here, let's go further. And uh, here are some, some examples of performance. So though we don't have fully parallel multigrid now, uh, time is still uh, more efficient. Uh, the blue line is efficiency uh, in comparison with the old method. Uh, and that is because now we don't have this re-decompositioning and because we run on a uh, higher number of process processors, generation one, which actually means uh, work in one processor is uh, less intense. And so also now uh, we can go through different uh, uh, scenarios for uh, uh, decompositioning. Uh, we can use a lot of different things. And I'm showing here how we, and the code is doing that automatically. So on the right uh, picture, I'm showing uh, some uh, scaling, essentially going through, uh, we, we came to, between 600 and 700 processors and it was still going down which is good news essentially so let's go further please mm -hmm. one minute market please wrap yes up. that's it okay thank yes. you <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, basically uh, we have a new version of the beta filter that requires just one upsending and downsending and it applies a differential Helcoltz operator uh, which is going to give us chance to include negative side loads of covariances. And in addition, uh, we are working on a version that will allow inclusion of cross covariances, which is for the first time to our knowledge. We have a series of novelties that are planning and working on. One of them is new method for normalization of covariances. Uh, we already have some first version uh, for glo uh, global cube sphere domain. Uh, we are planning uh, artificial intelligence application for definition of uh, scale weights, etc. Uh, and among them, probably the most important one is uh, uh, Jim Purcell developed line filters. Uh, what I was showing so far were radio filters. Now we have line filters that should be more efficient. And in uh, playing with that, with this triad uh, hexad. Uh, uh, versions uh, to, 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 to cover the 2D or 3D version, we said, why not 4D? And so Jim was able to uh, develop uh, basically full 4D extension of these line filters, which we still don't know how to use, but we are hoping that we will be able at one point to uh, go with RTMA to uh, fully fold this scheme. And uh, where we are now with this whole project, we started implementation uh, basically in GSI as a backup version, but our real target is actually Jedi. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have one more slide with references there who want uh, to, to take a look. So that is also on in the slide. Okay, uh, we used up all our time, so uh, we have to move on to the next speaker. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, our next speaker is uh, Valerie Udin and uh, from CU series. Uh, he will, uh, the, the talk is a simulation of the middle atmosphere data in the FE3 GFS and the WOM, the first results and impact on the upper atmosphere. So uh, please go ahead, uh, Valerie, to push the present now button.
Can you see my screen? Milk? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So can I go to full mode? Is it correct? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, today, I would like to talk about uh, assimilation of middle atmosphere data in the FF3 GFS and whole atmosphere model, and uh, would like to report you briefly the first results and impact on VAP atmosphere data analysis. So, to start with, middle atmosphere data is basically observation of temperature, wind, ozone, uh, water vapor, and our tracers from the buffer trap up to uh, 130, 40 kilometers. And uh, I just show you some middle atmosphere data analysis results uh, sample from JSM-1 and FGFS 80 kilometers. And also, we'll discuss impact of middle atmosphere data and operational system. And finally, to conclude with next step and why FS may support with middle data analysis, middle atmosphere data analysis in the NOAA model. So on this screen, you can see on the left hand side the operational upper stratosphere data, which is cover 35, 40, up to 60 kilometers. This is basically GPS row, cosmic 2. The cosmic one uh, are radio occultation profiles. Also, we have uh, high peak channels of MCU, microwave channel of MCU, A channel 14 on six uh, satellite platforms, which is provide millions of uh, data points. And uh, in addition to this, we have ATMS channel 15, which is also can resolve some information about the upper stratosphere. The major point what I would like to make with uh, Jacobians, which is you can see in the lower portion of this plot on the left, uh, in the middle uh, corner of the uh, left side, uh, channel 13 and 14 have a very deep layer uh, spread. For instance, channel 14 has 25 kilometers spread, channel 13, 13 kilometers spread. And uh, these channels basically can be covered of uh, vertical resolution limb viewing profiles like microwave limb sounder on, on, the, on the right. And basically, you can see that averaging kernels of these uh, profile channels can cover approximately uh, with resolution 3.5 kilometers and provide uh, important vertical information for the top lead of the models. So in principle, what just I would like to uh, remind you that we have uh, near real-time MLS data of temperature zone and water vapor plus research satellite data, which is uh, latency of the, this data, something like five, seven days. And it's uh, in addition to cosmic uh, data, it's approximately 7,000 profiles per day that we can use in the top lead uh, NOAA model for simulation. Uh, I start with some example of what we do with a simulation of the cyber MLS temperature in JSM-1. And here I put example, one forecast for 2016, February 6, with is minor warming events in the stratosphere, Arctic stratosphere. And you can see on the top the forecast for 6 and 18 hours, you can see huge uh, big diurnal variation due to tidal motion propagating from below. And on the bottom panel, you can see the results of the data simulation. So you can see from this comparison uh, forecast and simulation that we dramatically change and decrease one bias of a one forecast comparing to the data analysis. If you look at the differences of with six, 18 hours and six hours, so you can see features of the diurnal variation which is mainly in the tropics presented by variation of the uh, diurnal type. If you look at the, again, analysis and forecast difference, so you can see that the major difference is coming to the Indonesian sectors when we have important influence of uh, non-migrating tides from uh, 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 excited by deep convection. And uh, how to verify that uh, analysis is better than forecast. So you can see, you can look at the uh, independent uh, wind measurements and the Indonesian sector provided by Japanese uh, network, uh, the, uh, equatorial network. And if you look at the Katatabank site, which is uh, one, one, 105 east uh, 
is uh, almost on, around the equator. So you can see basically that uh, meteorite uh, sequences, six hour average, and uh, VAMA simulation can match each, each hour very nicely, especially at 90 kilometers, when you can see quite good uh, agreement between this. This is basically confirm us that this data and analysis in VAM can produce very good uh, removal of biases in VAP atmosphere. And we started to look how we can incorporate this data in the, in the Fiji FS 80 kilometers. And uh, before uh, talking about the trial simulation of MLS and cyber data and of FS, I just would like to point out that there is well-known problem about warm biases near the top lead model of numerical of our prediction features, which is raised uh, via top lead to the mesosphere to 80 kilometers roughly. Here I put example, GEOS 5 temperature operational, a monthly mean temperature, zonal mean structure, and mirror analysis for the same month. And you can see by eyes difference between these two systems. The difference between operational GMAO system and reanalysis system is absence on the operational system, MLS, temperature profile of above, above five gigapascal. If you did you do differences, you can see persistent bias, cold bias near the top mod, mod, model top lead, which can be removed by simulation uh, MLS temperature above five gigapascal in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mirror too. So the similar feature of what we found also when we simulate MLS uh, data in the whole atmosphere model, for 2016 warming events and compare with GEOS 5 operation analysis and IFS operation analysis. So we have similar features between 60 80 kilometers without the simulation of MLS data. Operational system produce systematic higher bias warm temperature. So now we'll look at the first uh, climate simulation of uh, bio 3 GFS 80 kilometers. Uh, which is uh, in the bottom of this slide. And I'm sorry, guys, today is my birthday and someone decided to call me. Uh, and le le let me continue. So uh, you can see basically biases between FFF GFS uh, uh, in the 80 kilometers in the polar region. And I basically pull uh, what, what kind of biases relative to a mirror to. You can see biases in the, in, in the low in the, in the low, in the low middle stratosphere, which can be fixed by a simulation of a standard set of uh, uh, low atmosphere observation, but above 40 kilometers in a likely that this data can help us. So uh, during this trial data simulation MLS version of uh, four data, uh, we did uh, a simulation for warming events 2018. This is example of zonal mean temperature for one set of warming events. Uh, in the uh, Left upper corner, you can see zonal mean temperature structure of MLS and 10 day forecast F3 FGFS 16 uh, in the, on the right. In the middle plot, you can see two analysis with and without MLS uh, data simulation. And in the, in the bottom, you have operational uh, representation of zonal mean temperature for one set of warming events from IFS and GFS. In GEOS 5. So again, you can see basically that uh, FF3 does 3D war with cyber MLS can help you to reproduce something what uh, can see by MLS, of course. And when we look at the influence of this MLS data simulation on winds, you can see that uh, for this particular day, middle atmosphere data simulation dramatically change the zonal wind structure of zonal winds in the upper layers showing completely different tilt of uh, zonal winds near equator. And this tilt actually remind climatological uh, structure of the uh, upper, upper, upper stratosphere, mesosphere winds uh, seen from cl climatology. Okay. Valerie, please wrap up. Uh, you okay. have one minute left. Okay. 
And basically, the latest what I would like to see the uh, increment analysis between middle atmosphere data simulation and the ensemble base uh, uh, 4DNVAR system, which is currently tested in uh, in the in, in, in the preparational setup. And you can see basically the increment between temperature and winds differences. This is monthly mean increments are mainly related to the region above 40 kilometers. You can see what preparational set shows uh, big adjustment of the zonal and regional winds in the upper portion above 40 kilometers. And if you simulate uh, middle atmosphere data, so you have much less adjustment on, on this. And to conclude and go to my uh, summary slide. I'm sorry, guys, I, I didn't uh, switch. And to go to my summary slide, so you can see that uh, why you first may support middle transfer data analysis with Dublin place and race of the free uh, model top lead. So uh, basically, with first, both MLS and cyber vertical parkas can remove biases in both higher top models above 35, 40 kilometers. Upper layer temperature biases of numerical or level prediction model and model reanalysis system can be removed by MLS data. The next generation of no models, I think, should, should include uh, uh, work in stages. Side yeah. and present in MLS. They're out old. Put in new. Thank you. And uh, my apology, but I did not switch. Okay, uh, Valerie, I guess. thanks for yes. the present. There are lots of <laughs> good content, but uh, because we run out of time, we have to move on to next uh, speaker, uh, which is uh, Zhao Xiapu from University of Utah. She will present uh, improving the near surface short range weather forecast using strong coupled land surface data simulation. Uh, Zhao Qia, please, uh, you, Valerie, can you stop your presenting and then let Zhao Qia go I, ahead? Yes, I've tried, yes. How about the now? Yes, I do, thank you, thank you, man. And Thank so, you. sorry for troubles with this external. No problem. Zhao please go ahead. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. So, it's coming up? Yeah, okay. This looks okay. good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, I would like to present improving near surface short range weather forecasting using strong coupled land atmospheric data simulation. So, I'm going to talk about uh, why we uh, care about the near surface short range weather forecast and also uh, why we need to do the strong coupling and also compare the strong coupling with weakly coupling and also some of our results uh, about the implementation of strong coupled land atmospheric data simulation for GSA in KF. So most of, work of this work uh, done uh, with my former postdoc, uh, Neil Fan Lin, and uh, he is currently work with NOAA ESRL. So first of all, so why we care about near surface weather uh, forecast error? Because they are significant. So in many of the cases, we see even from the GFS or NAM model. So for many of the events like the uh, front and all this system you can predict a right, but near surface atmospheric condition, for instance, in terms of the two meter temperature and the 10 meter wind can have large error. So this figure shows you the monthly mean uh, error. So you can see how much significant bias we can see. So if we look closely for the local place, so usually in the mountain, mountain region in the western uh, US, you are seeing the this warm bias during the nighttime and the cold bias during the daytime. 
So this near surface uh, forecast error are significant. So then uh, we tried our best to uh, improve this forecast and to see if we can get be better results from the atmosphere data simulation. And what we found is with atmosphere unknown, we cannot resolve all the problem. So then we looked at the soil moisture because some of the previous study showing the soil moisture has influence to the near surface atmosphere condition. So we have two publications to address this question with the observations, single column model, and also use the wolf coupled with the normal land surface model. And we try to understand it. So what's the correlations between the, uh, this soil state and atmosphere state? So what we found is basically the forecast error in top 10 centimeter soil moisture and the near surface air potential temperature and the specific humidity are correlated and relatively large during the daytime and also during the summer. So this gives us a strong confidence about the coupling uh, and the coupled data simulation. So this is an example showing you the, how much correlation we get from top soil in the lower land surface model and the, the first model level of atmosphere model uh, for the months of July for the, uh, for the uh, year 2016, as you can see, there are strong correlations uh, between soil and the temperature and then, uh, this moisture. We also looked at this uh, average over the vertical level, and as you can see, so the most of this, uh, these correlations come up in the uh, bottom 10 level of the sigma level, so which means soil moisture can influence this bottom 10 level of the, this um, atmosphere model. So it actually gives a strong confidence of the coupling between the soil moisture and the atmosphere state. So then we did the uh, data simulation experiment to compare the stronger the coupled and the weakly coupled data simulation system use the NASA SMAP soil moisture data and assimilate into the WOLF model. And with weakly coupled system, so the soil moisture only assimilate to the land surface model without give the feedback to atmosphere. But the feedback is uh, through the uh, coupled model integration. For this strong coupled DA, which means we can use the soil moisture to adjust to the atmosphere uh, stage through the uh, covariances between the soil moisture and the atmosphere stage. So this uh, strong the weakly coupling, the weakly coupling is commonly used in many of these operational systems. Why the strong coupling has not been uh, implemented in the operational system yet. So. Uh, we did uh, for the one month experiment with uh, uh, this soil moisture data simulation, we did a cycling. And uh, so here is uh, uh, evaluation results uh, averaged over all forecast meeting time and, uh, uh, and the uh, domain over the southern grid plane and uh, also uh, for the whole model uh, verification area. So as you can see in here, so we compare the strong coupled with the weakly coupled and looks at this forecast bias and the roaming square arrow. So as you can uh, see here, so this, um, the red is uh, weakly coupled data simulation results and the blue is strong coupled data simulation results and the open loop is without soil moisture data simulation. So you can see with soil moisture data simulation, we get significant improvement in the lower level atmosphere temperature and the, and the moisture. But in the meantime, so strong coupling perform better than the weak coupling. So if we look the near surface, so which means two meter temperature and the 10 meter one, and the here is, this is what we define as a, a relative improvement. You can see 
So the strong coupling certainly perform much better than the weakly coupling, which means strong coupling is promising for improving near surface weather forecasting. Okay, so then uh, there are significant development here. here we uh, implement this strong coupled net atmospheric data simulation within the GSI in care framework. So in order to uh, implement this strong coupled system, so first thing is we needed to add the soil moisture uh, of the, this uh, full soil lay inside of the lower uh, land surface model as a control analysis stage. So, which allows us to calculate these correlations uh, or covariances metrics uh, between the soil state and the atmospheric state. So, this actually enables us to assimilate soil moisture observation together with conventional atmospheric data. And uh, so, in the meantime, we have the soil state uh, can uh, feed back to the increment to the atmosphere, and the atmosphere can also just uh, result uh, uh, adjust to the soil state. So this is a figure just showing you the temperature analysis increment in single uh, soil moisture observation. So as you can see, so how much we can get from this single soil moisture observation for the temperature uh, at the uh, first uh, um, sigma level of atmosphere. So you can see in this adjust well meaning this implementation is successful. And also we see the increment also sensitive to the uh, uh, observational error of the soil moisture. So then we did a one month. Okay, two uh, minutes left. Okay, sure. One month experiment and uh, we perform all these type of the experiment. Uh, so you can check our uh, recent monthly weather review paper for the details. But at least uh, the key point uh, here is, so include uh, this soil moisture as an analysis state variable result in the improvement in the both soil moisture prediction and also near surface atmosphere. Uh, prediction. So, which means we do the strong coupling resulting improved forecast for soil state and also for the atmosphere. Okay, so I think just uh, we, we are not finished our work yet. So, as a basic research side here at university, we now uh, work on further diagnose what's this strong uh, coupled data simulation system uh, changes uh, boundary uh, variables during this extreme weather event and how much benefit we can get and we can understand uh, so land atmosphere interaction. So in the meantime, we are going to examine the impact of this current method on the CV weather forecasting and also imp implement it to the, this unified model system will be uh, another plan. So this is my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Zhao Xia. Uh, we do have a uh, time for a quick question. Do we have a question on Slack? Um, not yet, but we're watching the Slack channel as well as the chat, if anybody has anything. OK, uh, I think uh, we do uh, run out of time to. <laughs> so just a reminder, we, we do have a slide, a slide channel for this meeting to uh, let everyone post uh, the questions and also presenters please check that uh, slack uh, week uh, to answer questions uh, if there are any thank you and uh, let's move on and uh, our next speaker is xu lu uh, from university of oklahoma the topic is improve u.s operational land falling hurricane predictions through assimilating coastal ground-based radar observations with the hourly 3D ENY system and the plans to accelerate uh, halves. Xu Lu, please go ahead. Okay, so can you hear me? And can you yeah. see my screen? Okay, great. So hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about using an hourly 3D ENY data system. Hey, excuse separate. me, Xu Lu, I cannot see your screen, so I can hear you pretty well, so. So, okay. I mean, the first full screen mode is that what you saw? Okay. 
can everyone uh will can you check you can see his screen no it's not presenting okay hmm. can you push the print now button on your right left right bottom <laughs> Please now on the screen. Oh, okay. Okay. Is that good now? Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you. Good. Please go ahead. Okay. okay, sorry for the delay. So today I'm going to talk about the user RD3 MRT assistant to simulate the coastal ground based radar observations to improve the landfall in hurricane predictions. So first I'll give you some brief introduction about our early work. So in our previous study, we have developed a GSI-based hybrid EMRG system with multiple capabilities. And using this hybrid EMRG system, we have found that with a self-consistent trough ensemble, it can improve the structural analysis and the following intensity predictions after simulating the inner causations from TDR. However, TDR is not always there, and usually it's only covered a very small portion of a TC's lifetime. So for example, on the left figure here shows a track of Hurricane Harvey 2017 in red. So this only shows uh, about 24 hours before its landfall in Texas. And uh, the TDR only covers this small blue region here. On the other hand, the coastal ground-based radars uh, which is shown in the colored dots here, pretty covered almost all the storm time since about 18 to 24 hours prior to the landfall. And the right figure here shows one sample uh, radar scan which captures uh, Hurricane Harvey over the ocean. So why Hurricane Harvey first? Uh, there are two major features of Harvey that um, makes it so interesting. First is that there is a large track of uncertainties, which uh, before and even after its landfall in Texas. And also, Harvey is well known for its heavy precipitation. So the figure here is from Gallinu at all 2020. So it basically shows that there is uh, over 1300 millimeter precipitation over a five day period, which is extraordinary. And we'd like to see if we can improve the model performance of H12 when we assimilate the ground-based radar observations to capture those features. So we have conducted two sets of experiments. One control, which assimilates all the operational observations, including the TDR, in the rd 3 d one model. And uh, the control plus GBR is where we assimilate the ground-based radar in addition to all the operational observations. So first, we'd like to see the performance of the system when there is TDR available. And the figure here on the left column shows the HRD radar composite for the observation. The upper panel is a south to north cross section. The middle panel is west to east cross section and the lower panel is a three kilometer high horizontal wind. So when there is TDR available, the control in the middle actually pretty um, produce a pretty good analysis and however, when you look into details, for example, the white region here in the west to east cross section in the middle indicates a wind speed over 55 meters per second, and it is much higher uh, in the control experiment. However, if we assimilate the additional ground based radar observations on the right, it can um, correct those detailed features more closely to the observations. And when we look at the predictions here, so the figures here shows, uh, sorry. So the, the black lines here shows the best track and the red lines shows the operation H12. Blue lines for the control and the green lines for the ground-based radar um, forecast, forecast. And uh, when you first take a look at the lower figure, which indicates the track, the operation H12 goes to the west and both control and ground-based radar goes to the east. So this is a good sign. And when you look at the intensity predictions in the upper figures, so first the control have um, earlier and the faster weakening stage than the best track in blue on the upper left in the VMAX predictions. And it also over predicts the peak minimum pressure on the right. And when you assimilate additional ground-based radar observations, it can better capture the weakening stage and also weakens the peak minus pressure to be more consistent with observation. 
And when you look at the pre, uh, structural predictions, so in this slide and the next, I'm going to show you the evolution of the brightness temperature produced by the control on the left from base data in the middle and uh, observations on the right. So these were uh, brightness temperature forecasts on day one, and this is on day two. So clearly, the ground-based radar experiment can predict a better brightness temperature structure evolution uh, over the first two days as compared to the control. So all these previous slides suggest that when we have TDR data available, the control experiment using a already 3D NVAR system can do, can do a very good job in the structure analysis and uh, intensity prediction. However, we can further improve those structural analysis, structure predictions, and also the intensity predictions when we assume uh, additional ground-based radar observations. And also, you remember in the previous slide where I showed, showed you that the TDR only covers a very small portion of the TCS lifetime. So when the cycles moves on and the TDR data were out, the control seems to have some issues when the storm is approaching land. So the figure here shows a particular case where the control analysis on the left is producing a, a extremely strong wind maximum, which is almost six meters per second greater than best track at the surface. And uh, so what happened? Um, when we look at the wind increment at the surface here in the upper panel, and we found the issue seems coming from the background. So in the control experiment, when the TDR is gone, there is nothing in the inner core region to correct the storm structure or the location of the storm. So it's kind of reasonable for the background uh, forecast to be deviated from the best track. And uh, however, when the storm is approaching land, some of the observations from the ground stations came into the inner, came to cover the boundaries of the inner core regions. And those a few limited and asymmetric data tries to correct the storm. And this is what you call it on the upper left, which creates a wind maximum increment greater than six meter per second. On the other hand, the ground-based radar observations can like continuously correct the storm inner core region and also, of course, its location. So the background of the GBR experiment on the right is naturally better than the control experiment, and therefore it's producing a better analysis, of course, with uh, uh, ground-based radar to cover the inner core region as well. And uh, when you look at the precipitation predictions here, so this figure shows a 107 hour accumulated precipitation. So about four and a half day uh, total precipitation from the experiments in verification with the stage four observations on the right, where you can see that the ground-based radar, of course, produce a better uh, wind band patterns as compared to the control. And at, so although the, the wind band is kind of shifted to the north, as compared to the observations, but it's actually a pretty good prediction for four and a half day prediction when you consider the track error here. So, and uh, this slide, which also shows another investigation for another hurricane, Matthew, in 2016. So the figure here shows uh, on the left is from the control experiment where there's no inner cold observation are simulated, and the right figure is where you simulate the ground-based radar observations. So if you just focus on the black dots, which indicates eye wall of the analysis during the evolutions over time, and the red dots is derived from the re reflectivity observations. And you can see that when you assimilate the ground-based radar, it can um, capture the secondary eye wall replacement pretty well. And when you don't have the ground-based radar on the left, there is almost no secondary IO formation at all. So a summary, when we have both GDR and the ground-based radar observations, they can be very helpful to improve the structure and intensity prediction for landfall in hurricanes. And the ground-based radar observations can be complementary to the TDR to produce better Vmax and minus pressure structure precipitation predictions when whether there is TDR or there is not. And uh, all these previous study were still working with H wolf model. So our next plan is to further perform research and development of the 3D of 4D and VAR for halves in collaboration with HRD and DMC. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, uh, we do have time for questions. Do we have questions from Slack? None yet. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. If we don't have questions, then let's move on to next talk, uh, which is uh, Yuming Wang from uh, MAP Map Lab, uh, University of Oklahoma. Uh, he is going to talk about the development of uh, convective skill static static background error coherence within hybrid uh, ENVR to to advance U.S. current and next generation CAM data simulation system. Uh, you mean, please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear and see your slides. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, we uh, we would like uh, would like to introduce our recent work about the development of convective skill static background error coherence to advance the uh, current and the next generation CAM data simulation. Uh, in 2017, we proposed a method to directly assimilate uh, reflectivity observation in the operational EMR uh, DA system. Uh, however, the static coherence was not used in the early experiments of testing this approach. Uh, for the uh, large-scale numer <coughs> numerical weather predictions, uh, including static coherence on top of the ensemble coherence through hybrid EVAR, has shown to be beneficial compared to just using a pure ensemble coherence. Uh, efforts to uh, construct the steady coherence for uh, convective skills are still limited, especially for the radar data assimilation. Uh, uh, this work uh, aims to address a question would hybridizing or steady coherence suitable for convective skills through hybrid EVA be beneficial compared to a pure ensemble coherence for convective skill data assimilation. Uh, in the current ensemble data assimilation method, it's effective this may be uh, uh, degraded due to the ensemble defenses. Here is an example. All ensemble members missed the, the storm during the DA period. Uh, this leads to a long spin up during the uh, uh, data simulation. One solution to address this issue is that the properly, the properly constructed static coherence uh, can quickly and efficiently add reflectivity that is completely absent from the first guess. Uh, this slide summarizes all constructions uh, for the convective scale static coherence for direct assimilation, assimilation or reflectivity. Due to the time constraint, uh, more, more details of our construction can refer to uh, this main script. Uh, specifically, to uh, construct the static coherence. Uh, we first extend the controllables to additionally include the hydrometer, vertical velocity, and the reflectivity. Other pairs of horizontal momentum, momentum and the moisture controllables are also added. To prop properly construct the static coherence, uh, the uh, horizontal momentum and the moisture control variables suitable for direct, direct assimilation or reflectivity are selected. One aspect of selecting controllable uh, is the cross variable correlation. Uh, it is found that the correlation of reflectivity with the, rel with the relative humidity and the specific humidity are similar. For the horizontal momentum, momentum controllable, vertical velocity uh, correlates well with the divergence and the donor wind, but its relationship with the velocity potential can be ignored. Uh, these different choices of controllable can also lead to uh, significant differ difference in the cost function gradient. The cost fun function gradient from uh, uh, radial velocity and the reflectivity are similar only using the UV and the relative humidity as controllables. For other choices, large difference in the cost function gradient can cause imbalance during the variational minimization and prevent efficient convergence and therefore lead to overfitting or underfitting uh, two observations. We also found that this imbalanced uh, grade, uh, cost function 
uh, gradient are caused by the large difference in variance or regression coefficient between the uh, varied uh, controllable options. We further examined these diff these choices or controllables. Uh, the result the results show that only option uh, UV and red humidity can maintain the storms more than twenty minutes. Uh, the storms from other choices uh, cannot uh, could not uh, be well uh, analyzed at the analysis time. Uh, the error stat statistics. Uh, are different between the clear air and the storms. So the storm intensity dependent beaming method is applied. Here we use the cross uh, correlation between the red humidity and the reflectivity to show, uh, as, a, as an example, to show the difference the difference in the error statistics. Uh, without being, uh, the, the cross correlation uh, is weak. Uh, uh, Apply uh, further further applying the beam method can greatly enhance the uh, the correlation. Uh, we also found that the what the vertical correlation can be different in vertical between the uh, strong storm and the weak storm. Uh, during the DA period, uh, this uh, the difference. Uh, this slide shows the difference between the beam method and the without beam method. Uh, during the DE uh, period, uh, the, we found that the beam methods can elevate the spurious reflectivity generation during the forecast and uh, unrealistic, and uh, also elevate the unrealistic uh, reduction of the water vapor mix ratio when uh, removing this spurious reflectivity. Let's look at the analyzed reflectivity during the uh, uh, DE period. Uh, we found uh, the analyzed reflectivity in being method is more comparable with observations than the no being experiments. In terms of the free forecast, uh, the being experiments can maintain the hook echo structure and the uh, uh, reflectivity coverage better than the no being experiments. Its mid level uh, updraft and what is it also, uh, also maintains a uh, stronger. Uh, storm uh, a longer also maintained much longer than the no being experiments. Uh, until now, the uh, this new static uh, new static covariance uh, is properly constructed. We will answer the question at the beginning with this static covariance in the hybrid environment. The results shows that the both hybrid experiments produce uh, the reflectivity analysis. Uh, much better than the pure in-bar in reducing the spin up time and uh, uh, better coverage. Further increasing the static uh, uh, covariance weight slightly improves the uh, analyzed reflectivity distributions and uh, intensity. Uh, in the subsequent free forecast, uh, the hybrid experiments has a better reflectivity coverage and a stronger vertistic. Both hybrid experiments produce a comparable uh, reflectivity forecast. Uh, in mid-level, uh, all, all three experiments can maintain the, stro uh, the storm during the entire uh, forecast period. Uh, but we still found that both hybrid, hybrid experiments produce the stronger storms, uh, especially for the hybrid uh, uh, experiments with the 10% uh, uh, steadiness uh, weight. Uh, we further uh, apply this uh, new construction of steady coherence for multiple corners case featured with uh, a variety of storms. The, uh, the results shows that the hybrid experiments perform better than the pure environment. Uh, the blue line here during the almost uh, during the entire 18 hour forecast. Uh, here is an example. Uh, a part of the storm is amidst uh, in at the analysis in the pure uh, invar uh, that can be filled up uh, by the uh, in the hybrid experiments. This slide is the, the summary of this work. A convective scale steady coherence is. Uh, Constructed for direct assimilation of reflectivity observations. Uh, 
UV and the red humidity are uh, the optimal moment, horizontal momentum and the humidity convertibles. Stomatistic dependent beam method is shown beneficial for the convective scale steady uh, covariance construction. Relative to the pure environment, the hybrid experiments with uh, properly constructed steady covariance can significantly improve the analysis and its uh, forecast. Further efforts are still are ongoing to test and examine the uh, new static quarries in the hybrid environment with the uh, NOAA collaborators. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yuming. And uh, do we have questions from Slack? Will? Okay, uh, I do have a, a quick question, actually. Uh, you said you are using UV as control variable in GSI analysis, right? Yes. Okay, how hard to change the code from stream function and velocity potential to UV in GSI? Yeah, uh, we, we, we just uh, changed the uh, controllable for build the stack B and also change the GSI code. Okay, uh, are you going to commit the code back to GSI? Oh, I, we haven't uh, committed that, but uh, that, okay. uh, we, we plan to do that. Okay, great, thank you. That's okay, very okay. valuable <laughs> for the convection skill, thank you. Okay, uh, in interest of time, let's move on to our next speaker, uh, Aaron Jensen from University of Oklahoma. Uh, he will talk about the impacts of, of assimilating Go 16 clear air and the cloudy readings observations on rapid initial 18 supercell prediction. Please go ahead, Aaron, when you're ready. Okay, thank you. I'm good. So, yes, I'm going to talk about. Um, a case study assimilating GO16 advanced baseline imager or ABI um, radiances from their channel 9 and channel 10 for a case of rapidly initiating supercells. I want to begin by acknowledging my co authors and collaborators, um, Zhuguang Wang, Krishna Chandramuli, as well as Jason Otkin, Thomas Jones, and Jeff Whitaker. Um, so, for background, the high space and time resolution of um, ABI radiances make them particularly appealing for convective scale predictions. Um, Direct assimilation of radar reflectivity can be er very useful once these storms are already initiated and have a robust uh, reflectivity signature. However, studies have also shown advantages of assimilating the ABI radiances, which can start to pick up on the storms even earlier than the radar reflectivity. For this study, we, we implemented the direct assimilation of ABI all sky radiances in the GSI ENKF coupled to the WARF model. ABI has 16 total channels, um, including visible and infrared. Uh, past studies have focused on only assimilating a single channel at one time. Uh, so in this study, we'll start to consider some of the complementary aspects of assimilating different channels. This presentation will focus on the impact of additive noise inflation and adaptive observation error within the data assimilation, as well as the impacts of assimilating channel 9 versus channel 10, and a brief discussion of some ongoing efforts um, looking at some more advanced bias correction methods for deep radiances. So first, a brief uh, introduction to our case study. There's a broad large scale trough over the Western US, uh, providing some support for convection initiation, which occurs along a dry line in Northwestern Texas. Um, we can see the storms start to initiate in the reflectivity signature um, a little bit after 18 UTC. By 1815, they're pretty well developed. Um, in the visible satellite, we can start to see the storms clearly initiating almost half an hour before that. Um, emphasizing the reason why we want to use satellite radiances to improve the lead time and skill of the forecast for this case. So in the observations, the two-hour swath of reflectivity, which is the maximum during the time period, shows two long-track discrete supercells associated with several severe weather reports. Um, we'll perform data simulation throughout the period, both prior to and during the convective initiation initiating forecasts at uh, four different times, 1800, 1810, 1820, and 1830. So for the experiment design, we use a CONUS-wide domain with three kilometer grid spacing. 
um, the GSI-based ENKF with the 40-member ensemble. We pre first perform hourly assimilation of the conventional surface and upper air observations from 0 through 16 UTC, followed by 10-minute cycling of first only the radar reflectivity from 1610 through 1700, which helps to suppress some spurious convection that's occurring nearby. And then we have continued 10-minute cycles where we add the ABI radiances of mid and or low level water vapor channels um, in addition to the radar starting at 1710. Um, you can see here some of the other details of the data simulation parameters. Um, and we do apply some simple bias correction, which is different for the clear sky and cloudy sky observations. So the table of experiments that I'll be showing today, um, we focus on assimilating channel 10 observations to compare the impact of no additive noise to adding additive noise and then adding, in addition to the additive noise, an op adaptive observation error technique. Um, and we also use channel nine and channel nine and 10 together to compare the impacts after we implement the additive noise and adaptive observation error of um, choosing different radiance channels. Um, the uh, relevance of these different channels are shown here in the vertical weighting function, which shows what height levels the channels are most sensitive to. For channel 9, it's a mid-level water vapor channel sensitive to about 350 to 400 hectopascals primarily, while the channel 10 is a little bit lower level, focused more around 600 hectopascals. So a little more information about what I mean about um, by adaptive observation error. We use the differences between simulated <clears throat> brightness temperature and the clear air component of the brightness temperature in the model first guesses to determine thresholds um, of brightness temperatures that are typically cloud affected or not cloud affected following similar me methods as Harnish et al. 2016. The difference below this threshold is um, a way of quantifying the cloud impact on both first guess and observation radiances. And we can then calculate a symmetric cloud impact by averaging for the observation and the first guess, and then binning the, all the pixels based on symmetric cloud impact and calculating the bias within that bin, the bias corrected root mean square innovation, which is contributed both from the observation error as well as the model error. And since we have an estimate of the model error from the background spread, we can back out the estimated observation error um, as a function of symmetric cloud impact. So we do this for each channel. Um, so some of the diagnostics of our initial um, ex of our experiments during the initial data simulation period without assimilating any of the ABI observations, the um, first guess and analysis errors in radiant space are fairly large, stabilizing around 10 Kelvin. When we assimilate the channel 10, so assimilating channel 10 reduces these um, errors significantly. Um, adding the additive noise further reduces them. Then adding in the adaptive observation error, the red line, does increase them a little more, but um, it also decreases the innovations for the reflectivity space. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. So in terms of the forecast performance, which is another way of indirectly evaluating the analysis, um, the quality of the analysis, shown here are the uh, fraction skill score for 35 decibels of reflectivity forecast initialized at 1810, 1820, and 1830 in the different experiments. For the earliest 1810 initialization, the experiment assimilating channel 10 radiances but not using additive noise shows almost no skill. Um, additive noise adds some skill to the forecast and the adaptive observation error adds even further skill. By 1820, we do start to see some skill without additive noise, but with additive noise, it's much more. Um, by 1830, the impact of additive noise is still to improve the skill during the first approximately 40 minutes of the forecast. All the adaptive observation error improves the skill throughout the length of the um, about an hour and a half forecast. Uh, qualitatively, here are the um, reflectivity swaths from the different forecast experiments, channel 10 in the top row, channel 10 with additive noise, and channel 10 with both additive noise and adaptive observation error in the bottom row. The additive noise allows the forecast to start picking up on the southern supercell by the end of the data simulation period and picks up on the northern supercell uh, about 10 to 20 minutes earlier. And the adaptive observation error um, further strengthens the intensity of the storms. And when evaluated in terms of updraft helicity, we can see the advantage of the adaptive observation error more clearly, since it results in um, more coherent swaths of persistent rotation, which is more consistent to what was observed in this uh, long track supercells. 
So the impact of additive noise uh, can be seen by looking at the increment at 1800 UTC and a cross section through the initiating storms. With the additive noise, there's a deeper increment to the, um, the cloud condensate, which is the black contours, as well as a more significant increase in moisture at low to mid levels, which is the green contours, and a strong cooling effect on temperature at upper levels, which helps to destabilize the atmosphere and encourages development of the storm in subsequent cycles. Um, I should note that we use a very simple additive noise, which is just um, random perturbations added wherever the uh, wherever the observations indicate cloud, but the background ensemble mean does not indicate cloud to compensate for the fact that if all of the ensemble members miss the storm in the background forecast, we will have trouble adding the storm without additive noise. Uh, the impact of the adaptive observation error is um, Shown here in terms of the background error covariance from an observation at the location shown here within the cross section, which corresponds to a radiance observation on the right and a reflectivity observation at about 400 hectopascal on the left. Um, since um, over a broad area as the anvil starts to spread atop of the maturing storm by 1820 UTC, the colder observed cloud top compared to the model simulated cloud top indicates a um, warm temperature increment and an increase of cloud and moisture over fairly broad area beneath that entire anvil. However, the radar um, observation would, in, would indicate a more focused increment to the, um, to the model variables within the storm updraft. Um, so essentially the reflectivity observations are able to better constrain the internal storm structure um, focused on the updraft as opposed to the broader characteristics of the anvil that the um, radiances can see. So allowing the adaptive observation error allows it to give more weight to the radar observations as the storm starts to mature um, and provides a better balance between the information coming from those two sources of information. Aram, uh, how, uh, please wrap up. You have one minute left. Okay, so we also look at the, uh, compare the impact of channel nine versus channel 10. The channel nine observations um, assimilate the southern storm a little bit faster. And the main reason for this shown here in the difference between the background ensemble mean at 1750 and 1810 is that the upper level um, observations of the water vapor correlate to the structure of the short wave that is forcing the initiation of these cells. Um, so it increases the vorticity at upper levels better than channel 10 is able to. And very briefly, we're just comparing different offline and online impacts of bias correction using both a simple method and a nonlinear method um, drive based on some of Otkin et al's um, research. Um, and I'll go to the summary and next steps and allow you to read this um, and take a question if we have time. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thanks. And uh, we do have one question, yes, right, Will? Yep, we have one question from Jeff Whitaker. Um, and he asks, was radiance bias correction performed for the GOES radiances? Yes, it was. Um, a separate constant bias correction coefficient was removed from the uh, cloudy observations separately from the clear observations. Um, and we get those values from an earlier experiment. Um, we ran through the cycle data simulation once, calculated the bias coefficients, and then went back and ran it again. But just removing a simple um, constant offset from the radiance value. OK, thank you, uh, Aran, and uh, thank uh, thank you for all the uh, presenters, and uh, we do uh, running behind our schedule. So uh, thank you very much, and this is the end of this section.